And I remember standing there and staring at the door with the bread knife in my hand. And I don't know how long I stood there, but I do remember having my hand within inches of the door handle and being resolved to kill my mother. And after that night, I was never the same person again. I think a good place to start is a basic understanding of the methods of, of like operations. There's actually like uh, entire organizations whose whole thing is that they sit and they study uh, how they operate what their uh, modus operandi are, like what's successful and what's not successful. Um, and what they're basically like seven steps that a cult goes through to like indoctrinate a follower. The key thing that you'll find is isolation. That's like number one is they get you away from the people that you know, they get you away from your support structure. They bring you either physically isolated to someplace rural or emotionally isolate you by turning you against the people that care about you or turning the people that care about you against you, depending on the situation. There's a lot more to it. Going in depth would be a huge video all in its own. How did it start for you? So when I was about eight, my mother got her master's degree in social work. And where we lived at the time, there was no work for people. And this is like 1998. So there was no work for social workers where we were living unless you had experience. So she kind of threw out the job applications far afield, and we wound up moving to Arizona, into like the Mojave Desert. What I didn't know at the time is that the place she wound up working for is like a, you can almost think of it like a call center, but like for mental health and like crises. So like she would see clients that would like make appointments and stuff with the center, working a lot with kids and like parents and people that were sent by the state. But then she would also do a lot of work with like emergency hotlines. So people who are planning to commit suicide and are calling in the hotline or people who are in an abusive relationship and scared, like they would call her. And that made her the kind of exact person that you find cults tend to target the most uh, vulnerable emotionally because you can't work that kind of job without like a solid support structure. Mm. Um, it's kind of like being a 911 dis <laughs> dispatcher. It's emotionally exhausting. Right. So if you don't have like if you don't have people there that can support you or like the uh, the right kind of mindset for it, it can make you vulnerable. I mean, even I know that if you spend enough time listening to the worst humanity has gone through, you know, it starts to get to you a bit. Oh yeah, I imagine you've done a lot of videos covering like horrific things, and so those are the people that cults like the target. You know, growing up, we were religious, went to church on Sundays and that kind of stuff. Moving away from all of our family. To Arizona, we had stopped doing that. So the one that approached us was small, wasn't very well organized, and that's like a that's another thing that people tend to misunderstand is that not every cult is Jonestown. They're not all like these big MLMs like Nexium. A lot of them can just be a few people with a leader. What it really comes down to is how the person operates and like their intent. And a leader is required for it to be a cult by definition. I have never heard of a cult that did not have a strong individual leader, mm. though I suppose, in theory, a cult could exist without one. Yeah, a democratic cult doesn't sound like the most natural of things. Yeah, <laughs> that, that sounds terrifying, actually. Um, <laughs> so they offered familiar comfort, like in religion. Uh, they offered like a support structure, like a, a shoulder to lean on. And that's kind of how they, they drew my mother in. I was like, you know, like I said, I was eight at the time. So my biggest concerns were school and, you know, going to like my after school center where, you know, we traded Pokemon and played cards and stuff. So they befriended her. And after the span of a couple of months, they helped find her a job, not at the center she was working, but rather at a school that was deep out in like the Mojave Desert. So we lived in a town called Kingman in Manzanita County. And this is like 80 minutes away from there at like freeway speeds. There's a few towns nearby, but like none of them have a population density higher than like 20. No running water like systems have to bring in from wells and that kind of jazz. So she started working at the school there. And so that commute every day was kind of brutal. So she would work late tonight, late into the night, and then drive home. And I would wind up being at like the daycare or whatever until like eight. So she decided with some 
friendly suggestion to uh, move out into that area because the housing was cheap because nobody lives out there. And all of a sudden, you know, one seemingly reasonable thing to do, move closer to your work. And we're completely isolated. You know, our closest neighbor is a couple acres away and they're of questionable moral standing is a nice way to put it. What we'd come to find, I would come to find out much later, is that like the area that we lived in was known and might still be known for like its underground meth production. Oh, yeah. So like you would see occasionally in the middle of the desert, these porta potties. Just sitting there. No construction site. A lot of times, not even next to the road. You just see it off in the distance. And I found out that that's because those were often used as the entrances to underground meth labs. So, like, the DEA had a big presence there. More than one meth lab was raided while I lived there. One was uh, blown up, actually, because it was too volatile to be, like, taken down. So, not a place where you can really build a sense of community outside of your friend group. So our whole life became this person and like their close group of friends that kind of surrounded them and like the church that they went to. It's strange because like when you fall in with a cult, it all seems so reasonable at first. And that's part of how they get used. They do everything in increments, right? So by the time this uh, person started telling us that like she spoke to God, And like God spoke to her. It didn't seem like crazy talk. It just seemed like, oh, okay, like, you know, in the way that we all speak to God when we pray at night or whatever. And it's like, well, no, she literally hears voices and she believes that it's God. And like by the time that like that kind of came forward, it was a little too late. If you expose someone to something drastically different from what they're used to right away, they're going to rebel. But if you do it in, in little bits, but it's all digestible. It's part of the. It all becomes part of the new norm. But like boiling a frog, you put mm. the frog in the pot, and then you turn on the heat. And by the time the frog realizes the water's boiling, it's dead. So that, but with people, you know, the first increment was, oh, well, you need to get out of your job because like it's killing you on the inside. Here, come work at the school. Oh, well, your commute is awful. Like, look at how late you're getting home, and like you're spending all this money in daycare fees. Why don't you move out here? Well, that makes a lot of sense. It's cheap. It's like, oh, well, you know, you don't have any other friends here, so why don't you join our church? There you can build a sense of community. It's like, oh, well, you know, all of these people in the church, like, (sighs) they're whatever. But this small group of friends that I have, they're great. We're all wonderful. We'll just do our own thing away from from them. Oh, well, now that we're all here, uh, you know, I speak, I have a a personal relationship with God, and I'm going to teach you how to have it. I talked to him, and now I'm going to teach you. And it's like the whole process, just very smooth. The other thing that they do that is important to understand is that in order to make you the kind of person who won't leave, they have to break you. The military, like if you were to go in the army, they talk about breaking you down so they can build you back up. That's a psychological thing that's done. Like they submit you to like certain psychological conditions so that way when you're in there in boot camp, like they can rewrite the way that you think and so that's what any good cult like any cult that like has a following or a presence of any kind their leader or whoever's in charge of recruiting is able to break people one way or another some uh have like a specific method that they do they have like a specific type of victim that they look for some are more generalized they just they have the resources essentially to bring in anybody that they want this one in particular, the lady who ran it, she targeted single mothers with kids. That was her target, which meant that like she never got very big. But the way that she broke people is by getting them to turn against their kids. Anything that ever went wrong became the kids' fault. So out in the desert, eight years old, we moved to this house initially that was like really run down and like looking back on it, infested with all kinds of bugs. But it was like the first thing available. It was ever so subtly my fault that we had to move out as quickly as we did, you know, because, oh, well, your son's just a kid. Like, he might get sick. He might get hurt. He's kind of dumb. Kids make mistakes. So that pushed us out even further into the boonies to a better house. And then it became things like, oh, well, these kids got into a fight at the school. 
well, it's your son's fault because he was there and this reason and this reason. And it didn't matter if it was true. What mattered was that, like, actions were taken. And I'm guessing you couldn't do anything to defend yourself. Um, not really, no. Things got worse if I defended myself. When I was there, it was a small school, rural Mojave County. Like, we're talking... I knew kids that got on the bus three hours before school started, commuted to school, did all of their work, and then got back on their bus and then rode three hours to home, five days a week. Because, like, by law, uh, schools have to provide busing to anyone in their district. And that's, like, how far flung people are out here. So there was only, like, a class for, like, people in my grade. And there was one kid who, for whatever reason, like, took it upon himself to like make my life hell and i don't know what i did like kids are shitty to each other right and i'm sure he had like a terrible life at home and like needed to like feel powerful and like i was the person available and so like even though like i tried to make friends with him like it never really mattered the one time that i physically defended myself against him i wound up scratching him along the arm and causing him to bleed i wound up going to a scared straight program because of that oh my god yeah so speaking up, defending yourself, like these are all things that like they they turn into negative. If you call them out on something, for example, well, you're being rude or you're back talking. That said, at eight, I was still in that space of like, oh, well, an adult has told me this, so it must be true. If I asked questions or the wrong kinds of questions, that could be seen as like back talk. If I got upset because like I was being told to do something unpleasant, like than it was I had behavioral issues. And this is all incremental as well. So like, it sounds like, well, why didn't you notice? Well, it's like, because initially it was just like, I got upset because we had to move away from all of my friends. Oh, well, you know, moving is hard on a kid. And then like, when I got upset about other things, it's, he doesn't seem to be handling the move very well. To, you know, maybe he needs to talk to somebody. I know a person. You should talk to this person I know. And then suddenly it's, I think he might have behavioral issues. To get specific because my mother was single uh, and i grew up ostensibly without a father in order to fix me, the leader would send me off with her son a couple times a week for training to like teach me how to be a man or whatever um and like correct my behavioral issues and those were some of like the worst moments of my life i have only ever almost killed someone twice and one of those times was in an outing with him one of his favorite things to do would be to like fill a backpack with like uh like a like a hiking backpack like the big ones with like some a little bit of food a little bit of water uh, a couple of other miscellaneous supplies and then in mine he would stack rocks as many as he could inside of the backpack strap it on me and then we would go march off and hike for like three or four hours in a direction until he was satisfied. And this is all under the guise of toughening me up because I'm too sensitive. That was the big thing for me personally, was that you know because I got upset, I was too sensitive. Because I empathized with people too much, I was too sensitive. Which is never a good mindset to have for a kid, by the yeah. way. Yeah, <laughs> right. Now, as an adult, I'm like, whenever I hear someone's like, oh, they're too sensitive, that's usually a red flag. Mm -hmm. uh, I can count on my, my hand, on one hand, the number of times someone has said, they're a little too sensitive, and it wasn't like... Oh, you're just an asshole. <laughs> yeah. We would get out to wherever it is. Uh, and I remember one time in specific, you know, it's not yet the hottest part of summer, but like in the day, it's still hitting 98 to 100 degrees. And we go out and we're walking for hours. And like we go through this barbed wire fence, through a cow pasture where there's like bulls. And these are not like happy, friendly cows. <laughs> these are like free range like steer that are gonna be like killed for meat they were not happy with us walking through their field but we managed to keep our distance we climbed up this little incline because you know arizona's a desert it's flat it's got like mesas and plateaus so no real mountains to speak of but this little incline and when we got to the top we took our break ate like peanut butter and crackers or whatever drank water and then i was given a watch told to stare only the watch for 15 minutes and when i looked up he was gone and i had to find my way home oh my god now he says he kept an eye on me the whole time but the desert is flat and like mojave county is is different than a lot of other deserts in that there's lots and lots of scrub like where we lived lake mead was not too far away and there's like wells so there's lots of scrub and there's lots of joshua trees and lots of yucca but there's not a lot of place to hide so 
I didn't see him at all for about two and a half hours until he came walking towards me from the distance as because I had gotten off path, I guess. But he come, he's coming from way over here, like maybe half a mile away, two and a half hours before we finally get home. And that might not seem like the worst thing in the world, right? Like if you're from Montana or Indiana, it's like, oh, well, you're kind of left in the rough a little bit. You kind of figured it out and then like they came and got you. But what you have to understand about like Arizona is that everything there wants to kill you. And not just the animals, the plants. In the Mojave Desert, you are more valuable dead to the environment than alive. It's like Australia for America. Kind of, yeah. Like the Mojave Desert has one of the deadliest, if not the deadliest rattlesnake in America. There's two types of rattlesnakes nat- native to that desert. The Mojave Green and the Mojave Red. The Mojave Red, if it bites you, it sucks. It's like getting bitten by a rattlesnake. If the Mojave Green bites you, you have about an hour. And to the nearest place with anti-venom is 80 minutes away, if you're on the freeway. There were feral dogs, like packs of feral dogs that would roam the area. In fact, one of the people we had to drive by um, in order to get home, uh, she was like a pariah in the community. So to protect herself, she would throw raw steaks out of her car window when she would drive up to her garage. And these feral dogs with like a couple of coyotes would come up and like circle her house and eat it. And so it became like their territory. All kinds of insects, black widows, and then like there's the plant life. Like I said, there's like scrub, but like all of it's really like sharp, ready to cut. Joshua trees, they're not like <laughs> like if you've never seen one before, they're they're not like a tree at all. They've got like this really spongy core of wood that's like not good for burning at all, and then they are completely covered in like these razor sharp like triangle leaves. That if you're not wearing gloves, like good leather gloves, when you're like taking them down, it will just cut through your skin. Uh, same thing with yucca. In fact, when we were there, we called them razor bush uh, because if you fell into one, <laughs> it would cut you up like you fell into razors. Everything there wants you dead. So being left in that environment, it's like at eight with maybe six months of experience in the city desert. And like a few weeks of experience in the rural desert was terrifying. I heard rattlesnakes at least twice on that walk alone. And I'd been briefed on what to do when you hear a rattlesnake, which is stop moving, identify the source of the, of the noise, and move away from it. The problem is, uh, depending on the environment, if you're surrounded by scrub, it sounds like it's coming from everywhere. That's probably one of the milder things that happened to me. The walking... And then, like, the other, like, physical training things he would do. Like, putting... Really fond of putting rocks in my backpack for some reason. Uh, like, there there was a scrapyard decommissioned cars he'd have me run around. And, like, I'm pretty sure I fucked up my knees. Because he, like, permanently, like, as a kid. Because he'd have me, like, jump off of the top of this truck onto the ground. Weighing, like, 80 pounds of stones in my backpack. And the reason that he expressed for this was to toughen you up? Oh, yeah. Because I was too sensitive. they called it training and like at the time you would think like okay well why didn't you say something why didn't you stop it i kind of liked it at the time because i was like oh there's something wrong with me like it's important to remember that like this whole time i'm being told that there's something wrong with me i'm not right you know i'm deficient in a way they're gonna fix me right so like in my mind like yeah it sucks i hate going and doing it but like i'm getting fixed and it unfortunately had the effect of like going and doing this all the time even at like eight i started to like kind of get fit by the time i was like nine i like had abs and i was like all right i can lift more than i used to be able to lift i like i'm nine and like at that time like my big dream was to become a power ranger when i grew up right (laughs) so i'm like in my mind i'm like okay there's something wrong with me so they're, they're fixing it and i'm becoming tough so this is like my 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 power ranger training this is like a kung fu movie training scene but sadistic as hell exactly except like my brain as a like a nine-year-old i wasn't able to like see how fucked up it was it just seemed normal because that's that's what my reality became things really got bad from like nine to ten because from nine to ten i started to question things and i'm given to understand that earlier like in the cult's lifespan one of the other members had two daughters one was a teenager that whom I never met. And that teenager caused problems for the leader, asking questions, talking back, all that kind of stuff. So the leader made her life a living hell until her mother surrendered her to CPS. 
any of those similarities that she saw in me, like she wanted to get rid of me before I became the next problem. In order to do that, she can't just say like, oh, well, your kid is causing me issues. I need you to get rid of them. Because like, what mother's going to do that, right? So she would do things like the problems that I had with the bully at school. She would blow them way more out of proportion than they were. Like that fight, that fight, I say, to put that incident with the, the scratched arm where I wound up going to scared straight in like perfect context, after like months being pushed around by this kid, I stood up to him at recess one time, and I was like, no, I've had enough, and you're going to stop. And mind you, this is after having been going through like all of these uh, outings to like train myself and toughen up and be like a man and not be sensitive. And so I said, I'm not going to take this from you anymore. You're going to stop it. But like, like a nine-year-old would say. So his response was to shove me as hard as he possibly could. So naturally, <laughs> I go tumbling backwards. In my mind, I knew that there was like a table or like some bars. I think it was dip bars. And they were just over here. And I was trying to grab them. But I was flailing my arms out because like I've been shoved. I don't have a center of gravity. And at the time, I really hated clipping my fingers. You know how like kids get quirks. Like I hated clipping my fingernails. It always didn't feel good. I didn't like the sensation. And whenever I was done, like I couldn't open cans. And, like I always felt useless for like a couple of days until they grew out a little bit. So as I was flailing, one of my hands just kind of clipped him a little bit and scraped his arm and caused like the smallest cut that allowed for like a drop of blood to run down. I still remember how little it was. And then I hit the ground. The cult leader was involved with the school, found out about this, and made it huge. I talked about expelling me, saying that I assaulted the kid. You know, that like, I've been, I've been growing my fingernails out to use as weapons. You know, that we've always had problems, and I've been tormenting this kid for months now. Despite the fact that I'd asked the teacher of that room on numerous occasions to just change my seat with somebody else's so I didn't have to sit next to this kid. Because that was part of the problem, is that I would sit next to him. And he would like kick me under the desk while I'm trying to like do math or something. He would just do whatever he could to get a rise out of me. And so in her defense, she reorganized the entire seating of the classroom multiple times because I asked to be moved. But she always placed me next to him, like directly next to him or in front of him. In fact, it seemed like every time that she would change it around, it was almost like perfectly designed to make it work. So the local police officer was called. He turned out to be the sheriff. I was clearly in a bad mood because nobody was listening to my side of the story. And everyone was telling me that I attacked this kid. And I'm like trying to explain, like, no, he shoved me. I was just trying to grab something, but it didn't matter. I didn't, didn't have the opportunity to talk. Um, and if I did try to speak up, I got shut down hard. And at that point, I'd already learned that like trying to talk back is just going to make things worse. So I give the officer some attitude. Just like, he asked me what's happened. And I respond with something uh, like, doesn't matter. You're not going to believe me anyway. You're going to arrest me or what? <laughs> I just, I remember, I remember the look on his face to this day. Like, like who the fuck <laughs> is this little shit? <laughs> it turns out that this guy was also like the local like DA agent and have like a drug dog and like took down hardened like criminals and like meth dealers that was like the normal shit that he did so like come into like the local elementary school and there's like a fucking sulky nine-year-old giving him sass <laughs> i have to imagine <laughs> it's not what he was expecting so yeah i wound up going into the scared straight program i got a like a tour of the juvenile detention facility i got to see what life would be like inside for me uh and what was fucked up is i actually kind of wanted to go because i remember being so mad because no one would listen to me because i knew I knew I was the one who had been wronged. I hadn't even actually struck out to defend myself. I just stood up like I had been taught to and I was being punished for it. And I remember thinking at the time, like, if this is how society is going to treat me, I'm better off someplace like this. No kid should feel like that. Yeah, I agree. It kind of threw the, the corrections officer a little bit for a loop because she thought I was just being tough at first and she was trying to scare me straight. And when she realized that I was starting to think that like I would enjoy it better inside than out. She kind of cut the tour short. She was like, she kept saying, trying to like scare me with like the other kids in the, in the juvenile correction facility and like how they would eat me alive or whatever. And it was like, and mind you, I've been going out and being abandoned in the wilderness to like find my way back carrying like heavy ass rocks. And like 
narrowly getting bitten by rattlesnakes uh, and like all this other crazy stuff. So I'm not scared. I probably should have been looking back on it and like the kinds of kids that were there, but I wasn't. So it didn't quite have the effect that they were looking for, but it did kind of further cement that I didn't belong, that I was different. And that's when things got bad. Like that's that's around nine. Uh, and that's when things took a turn because now I've got a record, not in the case of like a like a school record or anything like that or a criminal record, but like in the mind of the cult and like the community. Now I've got a record. Now I'm a bad kid. I'm the troublemaker because it doesn't matter what happened there. What matters is what everyone heard. And the tales that were spun were that I savagely attacked this kid, that I tore a chunk out of his arm. I still remember hearing that to this day. And I'm like, I saw the thing. I didn't tear a chunk out of his arm. I just I scratched him, which kind of leads into something else that you have to watch out for with these groups. Is that any decent cult, uh, we call it gaslight. They're experts at it. They will convince you that your reality is wrong and it's a part of their brainwashing you will experience one thing and they will convince you it was something else entirely and this has been happening to me for like a year at this point so i'm already beginning to question everything i see and like doubting myself so after you know a week or two of being like told over and over again that like i tore a chunk out of this kid's arm like that's stuck in my head that that's what i did and like that has like that's had a permanent effect like that kind of treatment that they did like to this day i sometimes wonder if i really experienced what i thought i experienced in some of the more intense moments and it's only when i talk to like my mother who was there and like horrified by like what she had no idea was talking that was happening i should say i went back and forth for days on whether or not to say the name of the leader, whether or not to say the name of the corporation or the nonprofit that they worked underneath. Because, like, on the one hand, if she's still alive, I don't want this lady hurting anybody ever again. On the other hand, what harm could I do? Like, what's the potential negative outcome from, like, revealing these names? Aside from, like, potentially exposing my identity. So I looked up her name, and it turns out she's got a common name. So you can't find really anything about her online and probably there isn't much because like at this time right it's 1998 1999 like into 2000 social media does not exist in the way that it does now like i think myspace existed um it might have mostly still been like bbc boards and stuff she intentionally took the name of another religious organization that already existed and then changed the spelling slightly So if you heard her say the name, you would hear like this word. So if you went to the phone book to look it up and called that number, it would be a totally different place. She like added an E or like an extra D or something, right? And that was intentional because now you can't find it unless you know how to look for it. And even if you know how to look for it, you still might not be able to find it. So when I Googled the name, I found out that it was super common. So I was like, I can't reveal the name because like... I could accidentally point the finger at like dozens of other individuals who like technically meet these criteria. And I can't reveal the name of the not for profit because the only evidence of a not for profit existing by the name that I know is like a Latin church that does like a lot of community work, right? Even now, I know all of these things happen. I have like the literal physical scars to prove it, but like I can't find evidence. And that's like by design. And it drives you crazy when you're coming out of it because you're constantly questioning what your reality is. When things got bad, they got really bad. It wasn't until I was in my 20s, I'm 32 now, that I realized that what I had gone through was by definition psychological torture. The training sessions with the sun became more intense and hard to bear. And all of this while, like after this event with this kid, uh, the scratch, this narrative started being passed around ever so subtly that like, I might need to see an exorcist because now like there's a problem with me, but like in order to escalate it in such a way that like it's more palatable to swallow to like my mother, who loves and cares about me and is doing her best, like to give her credit where it's due. She was just trying to survive. And like after the scratch, the leader, basically one of her punishments for me was that I was only allowed to eat oatmeal for 30 days. Oh my God. No toppings, nothing. Just plain straight oatmeal. Can you survive on that as a kid? See, that was what my mother was concerned about. She was very concerned about the nutrition aspect. 
So she managed to worm in that, like, I would eat school lunch to make sure that I was at least getting, like, some kind of nutritional value. And she managed to get it to quit about a week early, like, week, week and a half early. For me in that time period, like, exact times is still very fuzzy and probably will be for the rest of my life. I think what's so amazing, though, is that your mother was negotiating a punishment with someone not in your family, not at all related to you, for something that she was convinced that you did yeah i think even then she had doubts but like she had to negotiate because like she didn't know how to raise a kid and it's not true that like she was doing just fine until that part right like i'm the first kid so like obviously the first kid is like the one you learn on according to the cult leader like she didn't know what she was doing she didn't have a husband she didn't know how to like raise a boy look at all these problems that i had she knew how to raise a kid look at her son He's, you know, almost 18 years old. He's going to get married soon to this beautiful woman. He's got all this stuff lined up for him in the future. She knows how to raise a kid. So clearly uh, she should be the one like doling out the punishments and telling my mom how to raise me. Like this is a learning experience. So if she ever has another one, like, she won't make the same mistakes. But even in that moment, like my mom still like negotiated for me. She still fought for me. The oatmeal was one part of that punishment. Another part was that there were like various trials that i basically had to go through like oh god one that left me in tears was i had to keep a penny pressed to the wood frame of a door with my nose for a couple of hours and if the penny hit the floor then i had to start up and i wasn't allowed to sit i had to stand while i did it and i remember getting within 15 minutes and like i'm exhausted because standing rigid for hours is like tough there's a reason they tell you not to lock your knees right <laughs> like when you're when you're like standing up at a wedding or giving a speech or something so i'm standing rigid for like two hours and i'm within 15 minutes and the penny starts sliding and no matter how hard i press with my nose i can't get it to stay and then it hits the ground and i'm sobbing because i was so close but because it dropped i had to be back in the 90s you called it spanking with like a spoon right but really it was just hidden so i got hit with a spoon and then i had to start over again this is another case where my mom fought for me and she only had me do like a half hour and she encouraged me like that's one thing that i remember in that moment really meaning a lot to me is that like my mom was like i know it's hard i know you don't want to do it but i believe in you and you got this and it's kind of like fucked up <laughs> a little bit to be like I'm really happy that my mother like encouraged me through this horrific punishment that I was going through. But like anymore, when I look back in that time, she wasn't the one doling him out. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Another one was I had been somewhat attitudinal. We were on like a road trip to like Sierra Nevada and we stopped for lunch at like this little cafe thing because I had been attitudinal. I wasn't allowed to go in and, eat, and I had to stay in the car in the desert with the windows rolled up. Oh, that's child abuse. I'm pretty sure my mom came out and rolled down a window after a little bit, but like I don't quite remember because I wasn't allowed to look out the windows. I had to stare at the floor. Oh my god. And if they caught me staring out the windows, then I wouldn't be allowed to eat lunch. I was broken enough at that point that when the leader's son came out and brought like a little like shrimp cocktail for my lunch, like in like a little parfait cup, like a plastic parfait thing, and he set it down. Because he didn't give me the explicit instructions that I was allowed to eat it, I, I could only stare at it. Because if I ate it when I wasn't supposed to, it would have been worse for me. So I had to sit there with it at my feet, staring at it for probably about another half hour. And by the time my mom got out and I was like, am I allowed to eat this? She was like, you were supposed to eat it when it came out. And he's like, I wasn't told I could. She's like, you can't eat it now. It's fish. It's shrimp. It's it's been a 90 degree heat. It's not safe for you to eat anymore. Like I'm starving because I haven't eaten breakfast. I remember crying at that too. Then the, uh, they're like spiritual healers, like faith healers, like the people who come out and they'll set up a big tent. They'll bring people to them and they'll be like, if you have cancer, God will cure it. And they bring you up. Oh and then they my like God. Hit you. They hit you with the Holy ghost. The worst part about those guys is that they are encouraging an unscientific approach to literally having cancer. Yeah, they're, they're awful. And this guy I had heard about from our pastor, they called him Lurch, which you might be too young to get that reference, but it's like a Frankenstein, like Frankenstein's monster, because he's freaking tall, like almost seven feet and like wide, 
And so at this time, you know, the idea that like I've been possessed by a demon has been drilled into me and like I'm starting to believe it. So when I see like this guy come, he's doing all this faith healing and stuff and I'm seeing him like speaking in tongues and then he does there's this trick that faith healers have where they they take their hand uh, and they put it in your core, like right around your stomach, but like underneath the diaphragm. And they like vibrate a little bit and they push with their heel in such a way that you collapse. And it's nothing to do with like the Holy Ghost or spiritual power. It's literally like an involuntary response, like getting your knee hit at the doctor's office. But it looks like magic. I was told he could excise the demon from me. And I'm like, you know what? Things used to be great. I used to go to karate. I used to like go to the movies with my mom. We used to have fun. I used to smile and laugh. Like, I don't know what's wrong with me anymore because I don't know what's real. I'm going to go have him excise the demon from me. Like, if he's, he's real, he's doing all this for these other people. Like, he can do it for me too. And then I'll, I'll be back on the right path. Because, like, still at this point, like, my idea of a career is being a hero. Like, I want to help people. Even to this day, I want to help people. Like I'm in like a creative field for work as like a game designer because games have a lot of like potential and power to help people in like a way that like I'm not physically able to do. And stories have helped me throughout my life, so I kind of want to continue that. So I go up to this guy. He's speaking in tongues. He's doing the whole thing. The hashabala and like he does the push thing, and I don't go down. And he does it again, and I don't go down because like I am. I am tight. I am stressed, and I am a ball of bundles, anxiety, and I'm scared that like if this doesn't work, I'm gonna wind up like the other member's daughter and sent off to CPS. I'm gonna be gotten rid of. And so he finally does it again a third time. And like looking back on it, I I can see like the frustration in his eyes that like I wasn't going down. He like basically punches me underneath the diaphragm, and then I I go down. And I felt such a wave of relief in that moment. Because that meant it worked. And we were in the car on the way home. And mind you, the cult leader has been building this guy up along with the pastor for like weeks at this point. Like he's this great healer. He's this great spiritual leader. He's got all of this power and that like God has blessed him in all these different ways. And so like obviously as like a nine year old at that point, I buy into it because whatever the leader says is, is the truth. I get in the car and I'm ecstatic. I'm the happiest I've been in years. And I'm like, it's done. I'm fixed. We can we can go back to normal. And she looks back into the car seat and she goes, yeah, we'll see. And I felt my entire world crumble. The not-so-subtle shift in narrative became that not that I was possessed of a demon, but rather that I was one. Because you can't excise a person's being. The things I was made to do became more and more physically laborious and intensive. And worst of all, they all almost exclusively wastes of my time. Like, we were helping someone build a house. I was given a shovel and told to begin digging the foundation for this other building or whatever. Like, they needed to, like, scoop out a bunch of dirt. And I needed to, like, begin the task. It's this huge fucking, like, rectangle. So I went around and I, I dug up a bunch of it. And then, like, after hours of backbreaking digging in the hot sun in, like, 100-degree heat, (laughs) the caterpillar that they had, the land mover, rolls up and then just (sighs) pushes it all away in one go. There was, like, a a log, because we were working on this property for a while. There was this big stump that needed to be pulled out, and it was, like, the biggest stump in the field. And everyone else is pulling out these stumps over here and here, and I've got the biggest one. And there's, like dozens and dozens of roots coming off of this thing and like i'm working on it all day trying to get it out to my credit i've done a decent job like it, it's moving it's coming in and out of the ground but i just for whatever reason it just can't get it to come out and so they're like so fed up apparently with me like not getting my job done that they go to do it and then they can't get it out and then they just bring up like they try for literally five minutes to get it out and they're like oh yeah that's in there mind you i've been saying all day that like this thing is stuck and like i can't get it out so they bring up a truck they wrap it up in a chain, uh, and then they drive and pull it out. The truck struggled to get it out, but it was done in five minutes. There is nothing worse for your morale than trying to do something you know is impossible. Yeah. Let's see, another time, we went into the yard, and we dug like a little square hole, like a little bunker kind of thing. 
uh, and we moved Joshua trees, and I, I dug it, I remember, because we didn't have a proper shovel. The, all we had was this broken, rotten shovel that was like out behind the shed, and I wasn't allowed to hold the gloves because there was only one pair, uh, and he was using them to move the Joshua trees. So I'm like getting splinters into my hand, and I'm digging out this this pit, basically. It wasn't super deep, like maybe three feet, and like we pile up Joshua trees around it as like a barrier, and like tie them together, and then like we found this... Uh, the lining, like a truck bed lining, like in like one of the little garbage dumps nearby, because you know it's the middle of nowhere, so people just tra- <laughs> drop their trash wherever. And we put it on, we secure it, and then we go inside, and it's awesome. We had dug out like a little chair, like section of of wall that you could sit down on, like a bench, and like it's easily ten. 15 degrees cooler in there than it is in, in the outside. And I was so stoked because I'd always wanted a fort as a kid, right? I'd always wanted like a tree house or like a little fort or whatever. Um, and like, we just didn't have the money. Your Power Rangers it. HQ. Yeah, exactly. I wanted my <laughs> HQ, dude. I was so stoked. I even brought, I remember I ran in and I grabbed like uh, my transformer and like uh, a couple of my action figures and like my yo-yo and I took them out there. There wasn't a lot to do, so I, I wound up doing a lot of yo-yo tricks. <laughs> um, I took him out there, and I remember playing. I was having a great time. And then I come out like a day later, and there's yellow hazard tape across the front. I'm going to go out to the floor. Why is there, there tape there? My mom was like, "Hun, you can't go out there. You can't go in there. And I was like, "What? why not? And she's like, because it's a rattlesnake hazard. And I was like, what? Because you've created like the perfect environment for like snakes and lizards and other things to go come in from the sun and you didn't put a door up. And I like died a little bit inside. There were two more like breaking points where like I thought I would be gone, like as a person, just like gone completely. Because at this point, like I'm being told that I am a demon, that I am a monster. I remember very clearly that I was not the spawn of Satan. I was the offshoot spawn of one of his little lesser henchmen because Satan would be too good for me, right? Can't even be the cool demon, dude. What the hell? Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> like, spawn of Satan sounds so much cooler than like yeah. spawn of that one guy, Ted, from down the hallway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the leader's son and I, we went out for training, uh, and he had found like this dumping ground, basically, with a full bunch of cool stuff. Right. So like we went out to make like little constructions like forts or whatever. Um and so we each like took turns and like or not really took turns, but we like we went back and forth grabbing stuff and we built our own forts. And it was like, ah, oh, mine's better than yours. No, yours uh mine's better than yours, blah blah blah. Right. Because like he's he's eighteen or like uh he will be eighteen soon at this point. So he's still like a fucking kid. Right. I know <laughs> at your age that probably doesn't seem as much like a kid, but when you get older, it will. Dude, when I was <laughs> eighteen, I was significantly stupider than I am at twenty. I I know <laughs> the difference. Don't worry. Oh, <laughs> uh, don't worry. In about five years, you're gonna look back at yourself at twenty, and you're gonna be like, "What the fuck?" Oh, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> so he picks up a rock and then he hucks it at me, and so I pick up a rock and I throw it back, and it like plinks off his little fort. And before I know it, we're, like, in a rock fight. Like, and the rock fight isn't even, like, the part that's, like, bad about this story. Like, it's obviously it's stupid, but, like, it was reciprocated. The problem became when you picked up a two-by-two, two, like, an old, rotted two-by-two, two, and they started hitting me with it. And it's, like, over and over again, and, like, you wouldn't stop. So I ran into, like, this field of cacti, and, like, I couldn't even defend myself because, like, I couldn't see anything because, like, the cacti are everywhere. And so he was, like, weaving in and out of the cacti and, like, laughing as he hit me over and over again, like, making fun of me. And, like, I just wanted him to stop. I had asked over and over again, and he just wouldn't. And so I had to do something, anything to get him to stop. And so I looked over, and there was this, I remember it clear as day, right next to a cactus, there's, like, this big rock about the size of my head. And it was, like, big. And, like, at least it looks like it's the size of my head. And then I pull it out of the ground, and it's, like, bigger than my head. I got into, like, a corner with these cacti, and I lifted it over my head, and I waited for him to come around the corner, and then I threw it at his face as hard as I possibly could. Because in my head, I'm not even thinking, like, this could hurt him. This could kill him. I'm just thinking, I have to do something to get him to stop. Luckily, he, like, blocks it with the piece of wood. The wood shatters. He's 
stumbles backwards out of the way and like nobody's hurt his life flashes before his eyes but he's fine naturally he's pissed i own that like that was not the move to make <laughs> but in my mind i couldn't even conceive of that hurting him because i was i'd been trained to think i was so powerless at that point that like i didn't even think i could hurt him which was directly at odds with like the fact that in my mind i was also like not allowed i remember very clearly i wasn't allowed near babies because i might hurt them and it seems like those two things shouldn't be able to mesh in your brain but they did and that's like the fucked up thing like that cognitive dissonance you get used to these things like you just like i'm not allowed near kids or like small like infants or toddlers because i might hurt them i can't do anything because i'm powerless i can't i can't stand up for myself i'm weak and worthless and there's nothing i could do so naturally is mad so he takes me back to the gra- the scrapyard area to this mound of fire ants, which like when they bite you it sucks it's not like the worst thing in the world but like it's not what i would call pleasant i mean with enough of them it's the worst thing in the world yeah so he had me stand on top of the mound uh and then he started pouring sugar over me because he had some like in a little mre packet for like coffee or whatever and he made me stand there and watched while this like colony of ants swarmed over my body it was not a fun time honestly i don't even remember being bitten it was just the knowledge and the feeling of like thousands of these things that i know could hurt me and would hurt me crawling all over me and the knowledge that i couldn't do anything about it because if i did he would tell my mother and the cult leader that i had thrown a rock at his head and then things would have been really fucking bad for me. So I had to just endure whatever punishment he dealt out. And from then on, it was like, whatever he said, was it was his way or the highway. So now he had dirt on me. I remember he would also do things to sabotage me too. We went on like just a drive, like a little four-wheeling like thing with like the pastor of our church. Because we were good friends with him. Because uh, he's a really cool guy. Like he went to like other countries and built houses for for people who didn't have them and that kind of jazz. And he was one of the few people in the town that saw through the bullshit. And like he did his best to help me where he could, but like he's one guy. Lee's son encouraged me and the other girl that was in the cult to like go and play with these frogs because it rained recently. Which is, that's why we were going for like four wheelings because it had rained. It was like monsoon season was like over. Um, because when it rains in Arizona, it doesn't like rain like normal. We get actual monsoons where like the amount of water that comes down is so thick and so fast that like it can flood the road in like a minute or less. But when that happens, the whole desert comes alive and it's beautiful. Like everything in those hours after it rains, flowers bloom that you didn't even know were there. Like animals that were in hibernation like frogs for example toads and things they come squirming out of the ground to like soak up the water and like hunt for like insects and things so we're going and we're running and we're like uh kind of like catching these frogs and like playing with them and i remember him telling me like why don't you go get some water from the uh the cooler because you know there's a cooler with ice and drinks because it's the desert and you gotta keep hydrated and so we go in and we we grab stuff with our froggy hands and then suddenly i hear it's like i hear a voice why are you reaching in there with your froggy hands you're ruining the water that's good water in there because like you know the ice is melting in the cooler and like coolers out there like almost everybody's got one that's got like a spigot on it so that way you can like harvest the water from the cooler mm. um because this is like an environment where like we had to go haul a big truck trailer thing to a well and pay money like in quarters to have it filled with like 150 gallons of water or something like that and then have it hauled to our place to fill up our well like i learned how to take a shower in two minutes because like water is that precious and like this thought hasn't occurred to me so one of the things that they did to teach me a lesson was they took my canteen and they dumped out all the water that was in it and then they filled the water with now the frog water the like froggy water from the melted ice and handed that to me and like that's what i had to drink now and then they had me sit in the back of the pastor's truck which has like the the canopy on it so all the windows are closed in the hundred degree heat again where like you're sweating bullets and like there's a stench of like oil and stuff everywhere i just remember sitting there 
staring at this plastic canteen of water, wondering if I can drink it because I'm so thirsty. But like they made this such a big deal that I ruined the water. Like if I drink it, am I going to get sick? And they wouldn't give me anything else to drink. Like my mom gave me like half of her soda when nobody was looking. See, that's what gets to me most is that your mother just felt that she had no control, you know? Right. We've talked about it since, right? Because, like, it put a wedge in her relationship for several years. But, like, I understand now what I didn't understand when I was younger is that, like you said, she didn't think she had control. She felt like she was trapped in this environment just as much as I felt like I was trapped. And I remember that just breaking me down even further. And, like, another insidious thing that the, uh, that the leader would do she would never tell me to do something necessarily. She would make comments that made it seem like a good idea. She created an environment for me to have the idea myself. Textbook manipulation right there. Yeah. And one of the things that she had started at that point talking about was flogging. Like a ritualistic beating of yourself as penance to God. And I was like so far gone at that point that I would do that at night. It's like I, I didn't have like a a whip or anything so i would just hit myself in the chest as hard as i could over and over again until i was like beat red crying because i just wanted to be a kid again i couldn't be the unfortunate reality is that like at that point i didn't have a childhood anymore whatever was left like that i had to like piece back together like it would never be like what you would consider to be a childhood i had to like kind of grow up in that moment which i would do a bit later but yeah i told you the first time that I almost killed somebody. The second time is a lot darker. So even throughout all of this, like my mom and I are still flipping. I like I've mentioned to you before that like she has been doing her best to kind of like like cheer for me and like help me out wherever she can because she's not at a point where she feels like she can directly defy the leader. And like to do so risks complete ostracization from the entire community. And like that's dangerous like really dangerous like in an area like that to be completely on your own with no support from anyone it's a really dangerous place to be because it leaves you completely vulnerable because crimes happen out there that never get solved like i found out one of the reasons that i was like spirited away in the way that i was is because there was a serial killer who was never caught that was going around killing young boys my age By sneaking into their windows at night and strangling them in their sleep and then leaving suicide notes to make it look like it was all part of like a suicide pact. But my mom worked at the school and she knew these kids and like she's a mental health expert. She knew that they weren't suicidal. Connect the dots. Yeah, like that's the kind of stuff that happens out there. Whoever did that is probably still alive and they will never be caught. Oh my God. Shortly after the rock incident, I am starting to really crack and break like i can feel who i am as a person deteriorating around me because nothing i do nothing i say is ever good enough i started i remember i started playing this game in my head where i would try to anticipate any possible response that could possibly be said to me by the cult leader and then have the perfect response that i couldn't possibly get in trouble for in return i know now as an adult that this is just like hyper vigilance and anxiety but in my head it's like as a kid i i I turned it into a game and i could never win it no matter what i did even if like what i said or what i did was in line with what i was told to do suddenly it was now in like direct contradiction so nothing i could do was right and i remember the leader talking to my mother And it was said loud enough for me to hear, very clearly loud enough for me to hear, in such a way that it appeared as though it wasn't being said to me, that my mother should start locking her doors at night, like her door to her bedroom, because problem children sometimes attack their parents. And like she rattled off a case of like this kid who had killed his parents, like stabbed them to death in the night. And so my mom said she would. Looking back on it, I'm positive that she was just saying that to like move the conversation along but in that moment i like died on the inside like it didn't break like people talk about like feeling something snap in their brain i didn't have that it was just like everything that i was was a small fire that i had desperately been trying to keep alive 
and it's like somebody walked up to this tiny little flame and just poured a glass of water on it. And I remember just feeling cold and I couldn't sleep that night. And I was plagued by this thought that like, if even my mother thinks I'm dangerous, then there's no point in fighting. Like I really am a monster. And if I am a monster, then I should stop fighting what I'm supposed to be. And so I got up that night and I walked into the kitchen and I grabbed the bread knife that my mother still owns to this day and I have not touched since. And I stood outside her door and I had resolved that if it was locked, that that meant it was true and that I was a monster. And I remember standing there and staring at the door with the bread knife in my hand. And I don't know how long I stood there, but I was too scared to like turn the handle of the door. I don't remember putting the bread knife back and I don't remember getting into bed, but I do remember having my hand within inches of the door handle and being resolved to kill my mother. And after that night, I was never the same person again. It was a long time ago, so I've done a lot of work since. But my time came to a close, and I'll remember this, because this also shaped who I was for like the rest of my life. I had been a huge fan of video games uh, growing up. I'm 10 years old at this point. And this is maybe like a couple of weeks to a month after the knife incident. And we had gone to this nearby town for like this little like celebration that they did. And like mom was talking to some people there that she had she had been told about, and she was like making friends. And it was like the first time in a long time, actually, that I remember seeing her like happy and enjoying herself and i hadn't had a video game in years at this point and like i grew up with them like my grandmother and i used to play legend of zelda together the original one the nes and my job too young to actually play the game at this point so i had pulled the prima strategy guide open for her while my grandma like went through and did all the stuff to beat the game that is so sweet right so like to this day like legend of zelda is my favorite series because i still remember those times spent with my grandma like my family we weren't really wealthy or anything like we weren't wealthy but like we had enough to get by and like it's the 90s so like the economy was good Mm -hmm. but like we had a computer and like my family would do like mahjong tournaments where like they would take turns playing mahjong i learned how to like type and stuff by playing like putt putt and like other games on the computer oh my god putt putt yeah putt putt and pajama sam so like video games computers like that's part of my life growing up and so like for a couple of years at this point i haven't had anything like no electronic devices whatsoever well that's not true i had a radio and i had a walkman a cd player funny story about the radio it didn't get music stations but it would occasionally at night catch what must have been like a drive-in v theater or something from like mexico i swear (laughs) Because I would listen to movies in Spanish, like once or twice a month. Do you know any Spanish? No. <laughs> like Los Baños is a place, uh, and that means the bathrooms. Uh, but like, uh, so I like wound up listening to the movie Scream in Spanish at one point. I think that was either in Arizona or that was in California. I don't remember which one. So when we go to this like little festival, my mom makes friends. With like the big like the lady in charge of town essentially and we go there and there's a nintendo 64 sitting there next to like this old crt tv was a nintendo 64 and they had like motocross like games and they had i think they had mario party and i remember seeing they had legend of zelda the ocarina of time oh which was the first video game i ever beat the forest temple still scares the bejeebus out of me um so i see it and it's like this golden light from my past and so i go over to the the other girls who's in the cult and i'm like you have to play this game it's the best game in the entire world you're not going to get another chance to play it you know out here in the boonies your house barely has electricity and you don't even have a television you got to do it now i'll show you how to play it and so she starts playing it and she loads in and she gets the ocarina for the first time and like she's trying to figure out how to play it and so i i remember reaching over her shoulder and going like, no, no, use use the C buttons over here. And like these these are like the notes, and you can press this one, and then the stick over here controls like the tune. And I hear this yell from the other room as the leader sees me like doing this and like shrieks at me and accuses me of touching this girl, like in a sexual manner, basically molesting her. 
sexually assaulting her right there in front of everyone. This turned out to be a good thing, believe it or not, because there were too many people there. She overplayed her hand. This is a classic step in sense of like a of like somebody like kind of overstepping what they're capable of. She tried to like spin this narrative that like I was like sexually assaulting and groping and groping this girl, you know, at ten. And like the other people in the room and like this lady is like, no, they're just playing video games. They've been playing on the sixty four basically since they got here. Like, I, I was standing right here. I could see. He was nowhere near. Like, he was pointing at the buttons. And she was insistent, insistent, insistent. That was the final straw. Like, that was the final push that my mother needed. And so, and like, at that same time, the serial killings were happening. It was either that night or the next one. I think it might have been that night. I was on a plane on, the way, on my way to where my family lived to stay with them until my mom could come back. Um, and I never, under, I didn't understand why at the time. It turns out it's because at that point, my mom realized just how deep in it she was and just how unhinged the people we were around were. And she was worried about what might happen to me. But like those experiences naturally have like left indelible impressions on like myself as an individual, even though I had people like backing me up at the time saying like, no, you, he didn't do it. Like I remember shutting down like just completely. Once, when she started yelling at me, because it was like it was happening again. No one was gonna believe me, and this time it was worse than just like a scratch. So, like when I was being spirited away in the night, I thought my mom was taking me to CPS, because that was like the narrative that was constantly thrown in my face: is that like this other lady's kid had been a problem maker, and they went to CPS. So CPS was this big demonic thing to you. It was like the end of the world. Yeah, it meant I wasn't gonna be allowed to have a family. Anymore. Like, it was spun to me in this way that, like, once I got there, I just, I wouldn't be allowed to see my family ever again. I'm finally, like, spirited away, and I, I arrive with my, my aunt and my uncle uh, and my two cousins, and, like, well, life starts again. And, like, I was a bit weird when I came back, I'm not gonna lie. Like, my aunt would sit, would ask me to do something, and I would, like, accomplish it like a robot, like, to the letter. And this is like the really, really insidious part. And this is like the lasting effect of like what these places can do to people. There was so much toxic shit that they implanted in my mind that I didn't even realize was in there. That I have spent a large chunk of my life trying to deprogram from. Like, I re the first time I really realized that there was a problem was like... I remember I was driving. I got my driver's license at like 18 and I was driving by and I just gotten like out of this big, heavy conversation with a friend of mine about how like how stupid it was that our school was restricting girls clothing again and that like women shouldn't be held responsible for like what other people do. Like they should be allowed to wear what they want to wear. And it's like fucking dumb that like we're going into summer. And like they can't wear skirts. And so I'm driving down the road and I see like these like three women and like bikini tops and like mini skirts. And the first thought that came into my head, and mind you, this is literally 10 minutes after that conversation, is what a bunch of sluts they're going to get rape dressed like that. Oh. And they deserve it too. Like that flash, like you didn't even allow that thought to happen. It just hit you like a truck. Yeah. I had to pull over into a parking lot because I was like fucking taken aback. And I was like, what the fuck? I don't think that. That's not how I think. That's not my belief system. That's not how my mom raised me to be. That's not how my family is. That's what the fuck. <laughs> like, yeah. Once I realized that, suddenly there was lots of these thoughts all the time, and I didn't having them constantly. But like, it was almost like there was another voice in my head. Like, there's the little voice that everybody has, right? That's like kind of like your internal monologue. It was almost like I had another internal monologue in my head. That was like instructing me how to think in order to survive a situation I wasn't in anymore. Like thoughts and beliefs that were developed specifically to survive in, in this cult. That's total conditioning. Yeah. So I have been deprogramming that bullshit out of my brain for like the better part of, of like a decade and a half. And it feels like it doesn't end because every time I think I've gotten everything i find some other little remnant nowadays it's not it's not big things anymore it's not like women's rights or like religious views or like political ones it's like oh well i can't buy that brand and i'll think to myself like why can't i buy that brand 
And I'll be like, oh, because it's a Jewish brand. And then I'll stop. And I'm like, why does that matter? That's a very powerful skill. You've learned to thought check yourself. I have to. Yeah. Like, if I didn't, I would probably be a Trumper today. Like, <laughs> oh. I'd, be, I'd, pro- I'd be like an anti-masker running around. Ooh, we need less of those. So I am so <laughs> glad you escaped. Oh, my God. <laughs> right? And that was never who I was as a person, even looking back as a kid. Talking to my mom and my family helped a lot because, like, they all remember who I was before then. And so, like, getting, like, those reassurances that, like, like no, you were just a kid. And, like, this is what you thought and this is what you felt at the time. And, like, this, you wanted to be a Power Ranger. You wanted to help people. That all helped me deprogram the, the, the nastiest shit. But, like, the unfortunate truth is that, like, the damage runs a lot deeper than that. And, like, what I haven't told people, like, that I don't really talk about is that, like, I don't think I'll ever be fully okay. Because even today... I still think I'm a monster. No matter what I do, who I help, or like, like what mental exercises I do, I can't ever shake this feeling that like I'm actually a demon, and that like if I ever relax, if I ever like let go of this like internal system of control that I've created for myself, that like I'm gonna kill someone, or that I'll go crazy, and that like I am basically a wild animal pretending to be a man but we know that's not true well sure we know that logically yeah but like the problem with like people like this is that they they attack you as like the core of your being right but one thing i have learned is that it's like it's okay to not be okay like what matters is not necessarily like what you think but like what you do we can get into like the nitty-gritty of that and there's like lots of bits that you can argue but like it doesn't necessarily matter why you donate blood what matters is that you donate it so if i donate blood because i have this deep-seated feeling that i'm secretly a horrible evil being and that i need to like do all this stuff to hide who i really am like does that matter that i've done something good or that i'm helping people no because the end result is the same so like finding a way to like live with yourself and like accept yourself for who you are is like really important even if it's something you really don't like and i know i'm not actually the spawn of a demon and i'm not actually a monster and that like these thoughts are like just really deep-seated traumas like i've been to therapy and i've I've had those discussions uh in a roundabout way but like learning to accept like who i am with these traumas as like a person and like that it's something that i'm gonna deal with probably for the rest of my life it was like an important emotional journey that i had to go on for a lot of people who suffer from trauma i think there's this thought that like you're weak or like you're not a regular human until you like overcome the trauma completely and i don't know that that's like intentionally put into anybody's head but it's almost like we go to therapy to get better right but like getting better and what it looks like there isn't really an end point you're still a hundred percent you even if that you isn't completely done fixing the things that happened right and life is like this journey and like we're always going to be changing like who i will be at 90 if I live that long, is not who I am now. And it shouldn't be. And that's okay. So like the long-winded like message that like part of why I wanted to like have this conversation and share this experience is because I know that there's like a lot of people out there in like really abusive situations that get these negative versions of themselves hammered into their very being. And like it's okay that like you're traumatized. And it's okay that you think that like you're scum, you're not. And as long as you keep telling yourself that you're not and you keep working on it, you are a complete person. You don't have to be fixed to be a whole human being.